Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Chuck Sheely from Making Music Magazine. I'm the creative director and content director for, uh, for the magazine. And we are delighted to have with us uh, for our next artist feature, the lovely and talented Ms. Bridget Bibbins. Hello, Bridget. Hello, nice to see you. Now you're calling us in from uh, Austin, Texas, is that right? Yes, just outside of Austin, yep. Very good, all right. Okay, well let's get started then. Um, you know, you spent pretty much your whole life as a violinist. Uh, how did how did that happen? Like, what is a what what is a life of being a violinist mean to you? Did you find it? Did it find you? All that stuff. Uh, a little bit of both, I would say. Um, I began learning violin uh, about the age of three, and the way the story goes from my parents is that as a kid, I was very bright. I could read and write uh, at a pretty young age, and I never really expressed any interest in the television, except uh, one evening, they had the uh, evening news on, and Dr. Shinichi Suzuki, who is a, um, was the founder of the Suzuki Method, where very young kids start to play, uh, was in a news feature on the evening news, and uh, I walked up to the television and was just riveted. Just, they could not get me to move away from the story and they looked at each other and they thought, should we get her some violin lessons? And uh, that was it. And they figured that uh, it would be a fun hobby until I could start school. And that probably shortly after I began school, I would uh, most likely quit and move on to something different. And I never did. I just always knew that I was going to be a violinist. Cool. That's good when you know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the educational uh, part of your life. As you know, sure. making music is very involved with uh, and, and uh, aware and encouraging of, of music education. I, so I um, grew up in a tiny little town outside of Syracuse, New York called Wheatsport. And we did not have a school string program in Wheatsport. Um, I think I graduated with about 60 people, so it was really tiny and, you know, everybody that was on the football team was also in band and chorus and there wasn't, you know, everybody kind of had to do everything. And so they didn't have the, the means to support, they didn't have the, the students to support a string program. Um, so uh, I started playing before I ever started school uh, and continued lessons through school uh, through a private program in Syracuse, the Syracuse Suzuki School. And um, then when I was in school, I also began playing the oboe, which I know we're focusing on strings, so that's oh. it. But I wanted to be part of our school string program as well. And, and I was very fortunate that Wheatsport had a, an incredible, and still does have just an incredibly supportive faculty. Uh, so my band director growing up would teach me oboe, uh, but then he also gave me room to bring in my violin and get creative with other types of uh, musicians, other uh, players in school. And um, I just had a, a really, really supportive uh, team, I would say, behind me between my parents and my private teachers and my school teachers. Um, and then eventually um, joined uh, the Syracuse Symphony Youth Orchestra. Um, which was another outside of school program, but at the time they uh, required that you still were part of your school ensemble, um, which I thought was really great because, you know, we obviously, the kids that are in the youth orchestra generally are the more um, serious and disciplined students and tended to be the leaders in the school ensembles. So I loved that that was a requirement and I didn't really appreciate that until I became a school orchestra teacher myself down the road, uh, which now feels like it was lifetimes ago. But uh, it, uh, I have been a teacher where the local uh, private orchestras and youth orchestras did not require that the students were a part of the ensemble in school. And so I lost uh, some of my strongest players and, and leaders 
because they thought, well, I'm doing this outside of school and I'm in AP this and college level that and, you know, IB this and et cetera, et cetera. So they just didn't feel like they had the time since they had an orchestra outside of school to be part of. Um, and so that connection I was really, really grateful for and uh, just had wonderful mentors um, growing up both in public school and privately that fostered my love and um, my passion for playing and really just never, there, there was never any um, doubt that I was going to, to do music as a career. Nobody ever tried to hinder that. A couple of times my parents were like, well, are you sure you don't want to go into, you know, be a doctor or science or something that's a little more stable and secure? Um, but the education component was everything. If I didn't have that, uh, I would never have, uh, if I didn't have that support, I never would have gone into the field as a career. Um, it wouldn't have even been on my radar, I don't think. Um, you, you are seemingly just as comfortable in the pit, and then I also see a million videos of you rocking out. And so you're comfortable in both of those worlds, which is always intriguing to, to me. Um, how does that work? I mean, uh, seems like that happens a lot with string. It's common with string players. They're, they're equally comfortable in a pit setting or a chamber setting as they are, you know, putting on leather and just rocking the heck out. <laughs> um, it's certainly never anything I imagined when I was a kid. And I think it is becoming more and more common and mainstream. Um, I was I, a self-described classical snob growing up and all through college. Um, I went to Syracuse University um, as a performance major and then ended up getting my master's in music education. And I never had any desire to do anything other than, you know, play Mozart and Tchaikovsky and Beethoven. And um, shortly after I graduated from school, I went to a, um, it was right after my, my master's. So I finished grad school and I went to a NISMA conference, the New York State School Music Association uh, annual conference. And somebody was there selling uh, electric violins and they did a workshop on what electric violins could do. And my eyes were just, I was like a kid in a candy store. I could not believe what I was seeing and hearing. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. And it was a, it was a weird dichotomy for me growing up because I was always interested in classical music, but outside of practicing and, and performing, I never listened to it. I was always listening to pop music and I had older brothers that were into Motley Crue and Twisted Sister and heavy metal and hard rock. Um, but there was never any connection between those styles for me. And then when I saw this and then eventually uh, connected with an incredible violinist called Mark Wood, who is, uh, he's like, uh, Gosh, I don't know, like the Jimi Hendrix of the violin. That's and, what I was going to uh, say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know so, him from the uh, NAMM shows. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he used to play with him at the NAMM shows quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I saw all of that and started exploring this other world, I realized that there was this whole side of music that had been cut off in my education. Um, that violinists, at, when I was growing up, there was one path and one path only, and that was you're in this classical box, and you don't make mistakes, and you don't, you certainly don't cre get creative on your own. You don't make your own music. You don't uh, move, you know, outside of this very square setup. And when I realized that there was this other possibility, and and I, I sat in with a, a bar band once, and um, ended up actually playing with them quite regularly for a while uh, <laughs> after I realized that, um, first of all, it's a lot more fun um, to get creative and to get down and dirty. And uh, the, the first time I sat in with them, I went in with this, with my nose up, you know, and, and uh, thought, well, I could play the Tchaikovsky concerto with my hands tied behind my back. And these guys can't even read sheet music. So I'll show them, you know, and then they said, okay, we're in E, go. And I had no idea what they meant. Yeah. <laughs> and I so just it's the bar band that changed yeah, your life. Exactly. 
exactly. Yeah. And I just, um, I was like a deer in headlights when it happened. And thank goodness they um, allowed me to come back. <laughs> and they said, well, let's work with you. I think we can, you know, I think we can do something here. And yeah. they, they taught me how to hear a key and, you know, pentatonic scales and all of that sort of thing. And so it was this really great exchange. And uh, I realized that this whole side of music had, had not been available to me. So I broke everything down um, and tore apart my own playing and uh, learned, learned from scratch again. I let myself be a beginner again and it was so fun. Um, yeah. And I think in today's world, um, just to kind of spin off from that, I mean, the pre-COVID world was tough enough, but especially now post-COVID and this weird new reality that we're in, you have to be able to diversify as a musician if you want to make a living as a musician. Um, you have to be able to play different styles. You have to know how to record yourself. You have to know um, how to market yourself and all of these things that just aren't taught in the traditional classical uh, upbringing. Well, I think that's a really interesting point. You know, in my world, I, I was not a classical musician, so I'm not the guy that you put a sheet down in front of and expect mm -hmm. to follow along. However, uh, you brought up a great interesting point that makes me feel, uh, feel great about, you know, rock and rollers and that we have a different skill in listening than, than uh, a lot of classical people do because, and I was made very aware of this by having classical violin players in my group for, for many years. I just, I, I, I've always loved that element of my music. And when I would say, take the solo, they would all take their violin from here and go, what do you mean? You know, and they're like, can't you just play? <laughs> you know what key we're in, right? There's four notes you can't play. Don't you hear that? Your own Yankee doodle in your head, whatever. And it was like this every yep. time. No. And so I used to uh, find myself envious of folks that uh, that didn't read music. I would I would be so envious of them because they had this freedom when you are what I call paper trained and you aren't allowed to color outside the lines. It's a terrifying experience to just create for the sake of creating. And you're so afraid of playing a, long, a wrong note that you just shut down entirely. So I found myself very envious of the guitar players and bass players and whatnot that I worked with that didn't read music because they had this freedom that doesn't exist in the classical world. Well, I f you made me feel much better about myself as a musician <laughs> because I have never been afraid to play a bad note. <laughs> And, I'm uh, thoroughly jealous. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, and uh, yeah, I mean, I well, like I said, I can't read a sheet very well. I can read a chart, jazz chart, yeah. um, but I don't do the notation thing. But you just made me realize that my skill of listening is is pretty good. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. That okay. makes this whole thing worthwhile. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. So you alluded before to uh, people who mentored you. Uh, who are some of those people who helped shape who, what you you and your music today? Oh, um, oh my goodness, there are so many. Um, I had incredible private teachers growing up, um, and I would say um, the the ones who influenced me the most in terms of becoming a musician as a career. Certainly my, uh, my private violin teacher going into high school and college, Roxandra Simionescu, who used to be the associate concertmaster of the Syracuse Symphony um, when there was still a Syracuse Symphony. Um, and uh, Ernie Muskies was my youth orchestra conductor. And he's the first one that made me realize that this was a thing that I could do uh, for life, which um, you know, it just, it felt like he really believed in me and he really fostered my interest, um, as well as my high school band director, Richard English, who recently retired from teaching in the Wheatsport schools. Um, and uh, in terms of this sort of new trajectory um, that I, it's not even new anymore, it's about 20 years old, but uh, it still feels new. Um, definitely, uh, Mark Wood was a huge influence um, in the way that he plays and uh, mentored me wonderfully. Rachel Barton Pine is another incredible um, classical crossover. She's a, a, an incredible 
world renowned concert violinist and she's also a total metalhead. Um, and so she's been a big influence on me. She's turned into a good friend and uh, we, uh, we can't talk, I can't talk to her much about classical violin because she just can play me out of the universe. <laughs> uh, but uh, we have a good time just talking music and, and uh, it's, it's really fun. So I'd say those are probably some of my greatest influences. What are uh, the things that make you want to play with a certain group or a certain person? That's a good question. Um, it's definitely shifted over the years. Uh, it used to be for me, um, name recognition was a big, you know, and I would get a call to play with Jay-Z or, you know, Christina Aguilera. Those were, I was like, well, heck yeah, I want to do that. Uh, sure. And um, more recently, um, it's been the uh, level of musicianship and the uniqueness of the music. Um, starting to find that so much contemporary music is just really derivative um, and there is not a lot that is new. Um, recently, actually right before the whole world shut down, I was on tour with a band called Guster, um, who I was actually not familiar with other than a couple of radio hits that they had um, back in like the 2000s, early 2000s. Um, and as I listened to them and got to know a little bit more about them just through social media and whatnot, I realized um, the creativity in their music and how unique each tune was and it was more complex and um, the violin had a really major role where I wasn't just sitting in the background and yeah, it's fun to be on stage and playing in front of 20,000 people, but there's something really special about being an integral part of the ensemble rather than just playing whole notes in the background. Um, and so I think that became much more appealing to me um, is, and also being able to put my own creative voice on the music is also really important to me. It's really fun. I see these days you're heavily into yoga and showing it. Does this uh, have any sort of relationship with what you do musically? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I started practicing yoga uh, when I was still a school teacher in Boston um, about 2005. And uh, um, then as my career path changed and I went from being in the school classroom all the time to being on stage more, uh, yoga really helps just you know, you find your center. Uh, it helps just keep me really grounded. Um, it helps keep nerves and anxiety at bay. Um, and also just kept, kept me physically fit for the amount of travel that's required. Um, and the, uh, physical exertion that comes from, uh, running around in leather pants. <laughs> and doing it's amazing and how violence. much <laughs> how fit you have to be to be in the music business, isn't it? Like people don't think of that, but you have to be in shape for this, especially if you absolutely. Yeah, it's extreme. Yeah. There's so much endurance involved, and yeah. there's so much. Um, it's such a mental game as well, um, both in the performance world, but also just in the ups and downs of a music career. You know the the dry spells where you're not sure how you're going to pay the rent, um, the yoga practice, the, the, uh, not the physical side of the yoga practice, but the breath work and the, all the inner work that comes from a yoga practice, um, helped keep me calm through those scary dry spells and also helped keep me level headed when, uh, things were really, you know, when I was like at the top of my game and, uh, things just were cranking. Um, it's really easy, I think, and I see it happen to lots of musicians where it goes to your head and the, and the real work of the yoga practice for me is the internal work and just recognizing that those ways get so, um, you can't like, you just kind of have to keep sailing through. What's on your mind when you're hitting the stage? The band's been called, you're going up to the steps, everybody's going crazy. What are you thinking okay, when you're walking up the <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, well, when you walk into a bar and they call you up uh, with the bar band, what <laughs> what's going on? No, I just mean being able to perform for humans, be, being able to be on any kind of stage. <laughs> I really miss that. Um, yeah, I do too. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and regardless, whatever kind of uh, setting it is, uh, it's just sheer excitement. Uh, my happy place is on stage and, and I really don't care what kind of stage it is. Um, and, and I've certainly been on all different types of stages. And it, it's funny, my musician, my partner is a musician as well. And he hates performing live. He is as happiest in the recording studio or writing music. And that is much less appealing to me. I'll do it because I have to, but uh, for me, it's the excitement of being on stage and the um, uncertainty of how it's going to go and what's going to happen. You know, there's, there's always is, um, butterflies, you know, as even now I'm, gosh, almost 40 years into doing this and um, it hasn't gotten old yet. So uh, just that excitement and the, 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 unknowing of what's going to happen, what sort of interactions will happen with the audience and what a particular solo is going to sound like. Um, all of that is just so fun. I love that, um, the unknown. Well, I certainly hope you find your happy place soon. So you get, you get to go back to it, right? So <laughs> yeah. With that, I think we have time for one more question. And I guess my question is, uh, I consider this one of the most important questions. What would you tell a kid who's getting into music or specifically violin, or in your case, oboe, just music? What would you tell them as, as their, to be their buddy? Oh, man. I have been fortunate enough to, to work with lots of kids uh, over the years. And I always say, say yes to everything. Say yes to every opportunity that comes your way. Um, because you never know where it's going to lead. Um, and that comes from not just saying yes to a gig, because obviously kids who are just getting into it aren't dealing with that, but say yes to challenges your teacher gives you. Say yes to your uncle who wants to hear you play, even though you have only been playing for a couple of months and you don't feel like you're very good yet. You know, say yes to every opportunity that comes because they all are learning experiences and you don't know where they're going to lead, but they're all going to carry you on the path forward. And anytime you say no, that path gets shut down. So uh, say yes. Yes, yes, the yes. The lesson there is the power of yes is stronger than the power of no. Absolutely. Well, I certainly thank you for visiting with us. It's nice to meet you. And um, thank you. I hope everything goes well for you and you're busy again before you know it. Uh, I certainly love your music. I'm, I'm a fan. I, we don't know each other, but I, I like your music very much. So uh, anyway, thanks very much for stopping by. And we hope to see you soon. Likewise. Thank you so much, Chet. Take care. Good luck. Thanks, Bridget. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, folks. Thanks for stopping by for another fun interview. Uh, artist feature with our friend Bridget Bibbins. If you had a good time, make sure you hit the like button here, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on all our, our social media channels that you see below. And uh, if you have suggestions or anything you'd like to let us know here at Making Music, write us anytime. We'll be happy to talk to you. Until then, have a great day. Peace.